Let's run the debugger one more time. Uh, so far, we start the program too. We've seen that we can do things like print arg c, and we get a value of one. It turns out that we can also do print and give it a slash and a format. So if, let's say I want to see this in hexadecimal. I can say slash x of arg c. Well, that looks like it's hexadecimal, but that's not super interesting right now. Just to illustrate uh, these formatting capabilities, let me just print out, well, 42. Okay, it tells us it's 42, but now if I say print slash x42, I'm going to get 42 in hex, which is 2a. And uh, if I, I can also put in constants here as hex constants, so I can say print in hex, hex 42. Now it'll say 42. Uh, so not super interesting here with just these constant values, but we can use these different formatting types to look at data in different ways. Uh, T, which stands for two, according to the documentation, prints things out in binary. So there's the binary value of 42, which is kind of interesting. Or, sorry, the binary value of hex 42. If I go back to the binary value of normal 42, I get that. Okay, so you can use those slash commands to change the type of output that you see from... Uh, from C, or from GDB rather. And there's a bunch of them. I can uh, print them in hex, in de signed decimal, unsigned decimal, octal, integers, uh, addresses. There's a whole bunch of them here that you can read through and make use of. Look at, it, look at them as strings, some sort of raw formatting, and so forth. Okay, now what we've seen so far is that the print allows you to inspect the contents of data in uh, in the source at the source level, but when we don't have source code like is the case in this lab We actually want to be able to just examine arbitrary locations So the other command for doing this is called examine or X and examine uh, uses that a similar kind of uh, Kind of syntax to what we just saw with the slash on the print statement, but it's a little bit more it, it, a little bit more elaborate so X slash and then there's three different things you can put after this and then uh, and the address that you want to have displayed from memory. So the first thing you can supply is a count. So the default for this is just one. So it's going to give me one of these things. We can give it a, a display format and that's actually similar to the ones that we just talked about for print. So X for hex, D for decimal, T for two, uh, and so forth. Um, we, in addition, we can use I to have it interpret that location as a machine instruction. And that's what we were just doing back here with, um, with that display command. So was, uh, the display basically runs an examine on a particular location. So we can actually, so remember the display that we were using was display as an instruction, the program counter. Okay, well that would show me that every time I entered a command. What I'd really like to do is something similar, just examine as an instruction, the program counter. There it is. So that's the instruction that's at the current value of the program counter. Okay, so we can uh, also do that format. In addition to the format that we want to display the information in, we can also set the size of the unit that it's going to read out of memory. So we can uh, use bytes, half words, or shorts as we've been talking about them, words or long words, which are quad words, which they refer to as giant words. So sadly, the abbreviations aren't the same, but one byte, two bytes, four bytes, eight bytes. And we can mix and match these things. We can we can specify the, a repeat count, we can specify a display format, we can specify a unit size in the same command. And that's what was going on up here with this slash nfu. Uh, again, the repeat count will default to one. Uh, and then the f and the u, notice importantly that the abbreviations here for the format are disjoint from the abbreviations for the unit size. So you can actually include these in either order uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the command because they're unambiguous. It's also true that when you uh, are displaying things using the examine command that it sort of hangs on to previous settings. Let's take a look at that in the, in the bomb lab itself. So what we're going to use in this case is we're going to examine the arg argv location. Now we know if we do a print of argv, right, that that's, as far as c is concerned, a char star star at that particular location. But if we examine argv, it just shows us the 
the, the value that's stored at that location in memory. So argv itself, right, it's, it tells us that that's where it is. And then if we do an examine of argv, there's the address and there's the value that's currently stored there. Now, if we wanted to examine um, eight values at argv, we just put in a repeat count. There's eight values uh, at, those, at those two locations. We can also, let's see what happens if we just hit enter here. Well, we get back our, uh, our last X command. If we say examine eight, and then now we're gonna go back here and use one of these uh, d display formats. Let's say we wanna see these in decimal instead of hex, which is the, the initial default. Well, now we get those same values that are showing up in decimal. Note that if we switch to say, I only want to see four values, and I don't tell it which format I'd I want it to be displayed in, it will default to the most recently used format. So it's still in decimal. If I want to switch back to hex, I got to say x here. Now I'm seeing those four values in hex, and if I now just say eight, it'll default to hex, because that's the last thing that I used. Okay, and then finally the unit size. Let's look at, uh, instead of looking this at this in uh, in the current unit size, let's switch to looking at um, eight bytes at argv. So now I'm seeing the eight bytes. You can see that we've got um, we've we've got uh, little endian storage here, right? Because this was the representation showing uh, 32 bit bits, uh, and we've got e7 is the least significant, then e3, then ff, then ff. And then in the next one, um, we've got FF is right here, then 07 or 7F right here, and so forth. So we can see the the um, encoding is being honored by these larger byte values. And then if we want to look at the individual bytes, we can um, we can look at it in that in that way. And again, that will default to future invocations of the examine command. So if I just say, well, I want to see four of something, I'm still going to see it in bytes. So I can change the size of the unit and the display format. Notice that because I haven't been monkeying with the display format, but just the size of the units, I'm seeing things in hexadecimal, which was the last display format that I specified. If I switch this over to say eight bytes as uh, decimal values, now I'm gonna see the same bytes, but now converted into signed integers. Okay, and again, the address that we've been using is, uh, in this case, we've just been using argv, but you can use any kind of an identifier that you have access to in the current code. You can use an address. Uh, anything that you type in here is gonna be interpreted as a pointer value, essentially an address to go look in the source, or to go look into memory to fish out those, those values. Okay, and this is more information about the letters not overlapping and the ability to kind of have the last value default to what you last looked at it with. Okay, this is where it describes the display command. We've already seen this in the examples, but you can come in here and read some more about this if you'd, if you'd like. This is just gonna, again, print that expression automatically every time the debugger stops and asks you for another command. And it talks about undisplay and so forth here. Okay, we can take a look at the registers in the machine. So the simple command here is info, again, info for our program, info registers, there's all the registers. You can refer to individual registers as we've already seen with a dollar sign. So if I wanna look at, if I wanna examine the program counter, that's completely fair game. It's got this value in it and at that location in memory is this current byte. Now notice that it's still doing bytes because I was using bytes at the most recent examine commands. If I wanted to look at, at uh, a different um, a different format, like say I wanted to do um, uh, I wanted to do giant words or quad words at PC. Now I'm going to see uh, the the uh, the 64-bit value. If I wanted to look at um, instructions at PC, well, there's probably an instruction there. 
if I want to look at multiple instructions, say 16 of them at PC, there they all are. So it's a really handy way to uh, just kind of quickly disassemble code that you're looking at at that moment. You could also actually specify this as a display value. If I wanted to always look at 16 instructions at the current location of the program counter, that's just going to show it to me every time I, um, every time I hit a command and so forth. There's uh, kind of four, in addition to just the, the ordinary registers, you also have access to kind of standard register names. And th this, because GDB actually supports more than just the Intel x86 architecture, these are standardized abbreviations. So PC is the program counter, whereas the register itself is the, the IP register. SP is always going to refer to the stack pointer, $FP the frame pointer, and $PS the processor status flags. So you can use those to, to get to the specific details, um, and that would work for you even without, um, without an Intel executable. Uh, another handy feature for debugging is the info functions command. Um, without any additional parameters, it basically just shows you all of the function names in any of the symbol tables that was linked in. And so you can see there's a ton of other stuff that's being pulled in here from, uh, from the compile process for our bomb. That's not super helpful if we're looking for specific function names, but we can, in fact, uh, use a version of this info functions that allows us to give it a regular expression. And we'll just take a really simple regular expression that's just all literal characters and look for functions that have the word bomb in them. Well, there they are. Uh, there's the initialize bomb that we've been looking at, and there's explode bomb, right? That's the one that we wanted to be able to set a breakpoint on before. So if we we're just looking for all the functions that have a particular name or that match a particular pattern, we can use this. And then once we have that, we can, for example, set a break at explode bomb. And again, because there's multiple identifiers that start with explode, um, we need to, uh, in this case, specify the particular uh, the particular uh, function in order to set the breakpoint. Now, if we run our program with continue, it's going to blow up, and the uh, the breakpoint at the explode bomb thing saves saves our bacon. And oh, I guess I still have this display thing uh, in place, so it's going to also tell us the uh, assembly language instructions following that that uh, location. So I'm going to say undisplay and then say yeah, and that will turn that off again. So a helpful way to find functions that you might be interested in breaking on. Okay, here's the final thing is the text user interface, the TUI. Uh, so um, I guess let me restart from scratch and we'll, we'll use the, the, the command. So the TUI allows you to sh show the command window. That's always visible, the GDB prompt. You can look at source code, you can look at assembly code, you can look at registers. Uh, and there's um, some other information that's included in this that help you keep track of kind of where breakpoints are and that kind of stuff. So let me, um, I'm gonna say layout ASM, the assembly layout. And we currently are stopped at the beginning of the main function <coughs> and the process actually isn't running yet so we don't get any information here. But let me just say start. So now we've set a breakpoint. Uh, started the code and got rid of that breakpoint. You can see here by the highlighted line that that's our currently, uh, that's the instruction we're currently at in terms of where the program counter is pointing. And now we get some more information about the process. We're at, th we're running this process ID. You can actually see that again from the shell. I can say PS and then grep for 14906. There's our process ID. It's, it's 14906, it's running the bomb command. Um, once in a while, as is illustrated here, the, uh, the this user interface when you're running TUI gets out of sync, and you can recover that by hitting Control L. <clears throat> That's just hey, restart, reformat the picture. I guess it's not going to come back from the grave here. Um, <clears throat> let me just bail out of here and start again. Start and then layout assembly. Okay. So um, one of the things that we can see here when we um, are 
running in this mode is where we might have put breakpoints. So let's put a breakpoint. Um, well, let me see. Yeah, let's put a breakpoint at um, initialize bomb. Again, we can do command completion if we've forgotten what it's initialize, initialize bomb. So the breakpoint's now been set, and then let's just uh, continue. Okay, so we've now stopped at the breakpoint at initialize bomb, and you can see over here in the margin, which is why there's this margin here, it's telling us B plus. Well, what does that all mean? So B means it's a breakpoint which was hit at least once. Remember that it keeps track of the number of times the breakpoints have been encountered. It's a little B if it's not been hit. Uh, and then plus and minus means that the breakpoint is enabled or disabled. So we can see that this is a breakpoint that we've hit, we just did, and it's currently enabled. Let's see if we say disable two. Yeah, so I now disabled that breakpoint. You can see that now the the uh, character here is changed changed to a minus. So if I re-enable it, if you look back up here when I hit the return key, it turns back into an enabled breakpoint. So that completes our overview of using GDB for debugging. I will post this uh, annotated version of the manual on the course website so you can have access to that. There's a ton more information inside of here if you're interested in learning how to become better at using GDB, but hopefully those sections that I've highlighted and discussed in this talk will give you enough information to really get going and get going strong on doing the lab.